Hallelujah. God is risen this morning. Amen. Jesus is risen. He's alive. Amen. Oh, you got to do better than that. Amen. <laughs> you got to do better than that. Amen. Amen. Let's have worship this morning. Let's stand and let's worship our King. I know He rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame He's taken away. My pain is healed in His name. I believe. I believe. to fight for me and I'm gonna see 
Lord, we have hope. Lord, we have newness of life. Lord, we have transformation from one thing to the next. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you today, God, as we gather here this morning, that your name is what is over top of us. It's your banner, your banner of love, your banner of hope, your banner of faith, your banner of grace that is over us. Father, we thank you that we can't earn it. Because, Lord, we know that if we could, we would boast in ourselves. We would be prideful. But, God, we know we cannot earn it. We cannot do enough good to earn what you've given to us through the cross. So, Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you this morning for who you are. Father, as we transition into this, this last song, God, I pray right now. Lord, that the anointing of your power just continue in this place as it is this morning. And God, I pray, Lord, that as we just continue to move forward, God, that you would just exalt yourself like never before. Father, some of us this morning have come in great need. Some in need of a miracle. Some in need of salvation. Some in need of healing. Some, God, just in need of hope. God, I pray this morning that you meet every need according to your riches and glory. God, that you would just move in a way we never expected, in a way we never could have asked, thought, or imagined, simply because you are God. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name. The Savior of the world 
was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon you. Sing high. 
Father, we thank you this morning for the overcoming power that you've given us. Father, Romans tells us that you've made us more than a conqueror. And Lord, in the Greek, it actually says an overwhelming conqueror. And God, this morning, many of us in here, this, we, we know what it means to face trouble. But we also know what it means to be an overwhelming conqueror as we've walked through some of that trouble and have now on the other side of that. And God, we arise in testimony this morning because of the victory that you've given to us in our life. And Father, we thank you for that. Because of the cross, Lord, our sins are forgiven. But because of your resurrection, God, we live in power. We live in an anointing to overcome. And Father, even though we are in this world, we are not of this world. We are a new people. We're a royal people. We are a beautiful people. We are a precious people. We are a people that are called by God, the Father, to bring hope to bring strength and encouragement in this land and in all the world. And Father, I thank you for that this morning. I thank you, God, that you provided hope in us when we felt hopeless. I thank you this morning, Father, that some of us, God, we've walked through addictions. We've walked through depression. We've, we've walked through anxiety. Father, some of us this morning, we've walked through loss. But God, even in the midst of all of that, you are hope. You have a way of bringing hope and allowing your name to be exalted in the midst of our pain and in the midst of our journey. So Father, that's why we're gathered here today, to exalt you. And to say, thank you. Thank you for being the difference in our life. Thank you for invading my darkness and bringing the light. Thank you for bringing hope in my hopelessness. And strength in my weakness. Father, we thank you. We thank you.
good amen. amen man i tell you what it is look at this wow <laughs> i tell you what god's good amen. amen and i tell you what all the time he's good and I, it is just an amazing amazing thing we have a lot of people here this morning that have not if this is your first time here this morning raise your hand all right that's good that's encouraging <laughs> in other words, Grandma Betty's been praying for you, and you didn't even know it. <laughs> and believe me, she's been praying, that is for sure. She has been for sure. She, uh, she is a woman of faith, I will tell you that. And uh, there has been times, I've known you for what, five years now? Six, almost six years. Six years, wow. Time flies, don't it? Especially when you're having fun together. <laughs> But um, but it's it's not. It's, she's a woman of faith, and I tell you what, she has been such an encouragement to me. Every time I've been uh, discouraged or kind of run amok or whatever, she kind of just knows. I don't know how she just knows, but she knows, and she always throws her arms around me and just says, "Yeah, but you know, God." <laughs> and so, uh, and that's just what happens, Amen. And uh, so, it's just good to see everybody here this morning. If this is your first time, can you open that for me, please? Thank you. And can you give this to Tracy back there for me? She's probably wondering where my notes are. Not that it ever matters. <laughs> Anybody around here knows I give it to her and I hardly ever follow them. So, you know, it's like, why are you giving that to me? It's a waste of paper. Um, <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so, it's just it's good to have everybody here this morning. All the young people that are here, wow. You, you bring hope to everybody. Y'all being here, you know that, don't you? Yeah. And um, and so it's just good to have you here this morning. So anyway, I'm going to try to preach this morning, but I tell you what, after that worship, man, alive. Wow. How do you preach after that? You know? Just open your mouth and let Jesus through. Wow, there you go. All right. That's, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Yeah, this is, uh, it, I encourage y'all to, 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 uh, to kind of introduce yourselves to this couple here. My dad actually worked with him, and my dad's in Virginia, and uh, he's got some family out here, and he's visiting, and uh, so it's just nice to see you all, and uh, man, y'all got spirit about you, I tell you that. <laughs> if you do, you do. So it's just good to see everybody. Of course, we got a lot of family here and stuff, and so it's just nice to see everybody. I sat this morning, and I was, I was sitting and praying about this morning. You know, I have had three sermons go through my mind all week. Isn't that something? Because when it comes to Easter, you can preach all day long. You can preach all year. You know? And I had like three sermons go through my mind all week. So then I finally, last night, I'm kind of just, you know, I'm on my way home, and I'm just thinking, God, what am I going to do? You know, I've got notes in my phone. i got notes in my truck. i got notes in my office. It's like, where do I even begin with this? And I sat there this morning, and I was just sitting in my in chair, and I was just praying and, and trying to be alone and just, you know, focus. And, and uh, a thought just came through my mind is, how do you articulate what God did on Resurrection Sunday? How do you even articulate that? How do you even have a discussion about that? How do you even share about that? How do you even 
explain it. And this thought came to my mind. You. You. And me. That's how we explain it. We explain it by the fact that I used to be a drug addict, but now I'm free. I explain it by the fact I used to be an alcoholic, but now I'm free. I explain it by the fact I was lost in my sin without hope, and now I'm free. That's how I explain resurrection. Because, see, what was dead, he turned around and brought life. And this morning, we have a lot of, a lot of people in here, we got life. We know what it means to walk down that path. We know what it means to be lost. We know what it means to be bound. We know what it means to need to be set free. And some of us this morning, maybe you're saying, well, I never did any of those bad things. Well, then I'll tell you one bad thing you probably need to get over, pride. Amen. Because the Pharisees said the same thing. And you know what Jesus said? You're religious and you're dead. And you know what ended up happening? Jesus rebuked them. I don't know about you, but when I read the Gospels, Jesus don't like religious people too much. Ugh. But man, I tell you what, he loves his kids. He loves his kids. And this morning, I'm going to try to share, <laughs> see how well this goes. <laughs> Just hold on, Tracy. We'll see, we'll see where, how close I get to my notes this morning. I don't know about all that. Guarantee. <laughs> but we're going to open in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. And this, this passage of Scripture, these, through these few verses, rather, of Scripture, are, um, I would say, foundational to our faith. Um, they are the, the crux of everything that we believe that is hanging on. And it, it pretty much summarizes everything. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says this, For I hand it down to you as of first importance what I also received. This is Paul speaking. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Thank God for that. Amen. I mean, he paid a debt we owed that he didn't know, and he paid it for it. Man. And that he was buried. Yeah, he was buried. Oh, boy. I know some articulate people in here are thinking, he said that word wrong. Yeah, I know. I'm from Kentucky, so I got a different type of language. You're going to be correcting me all my life because I got a different type of language. But he was buried. <laughs> and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Why does it keep saying according to the Scriptures? Because the Scriptures are prophetic in what was about to happen before Jesus even did it. So what is it telling me? It's telling me that he came and he died for our sins according to prophecy. He came and he died. He was buried according to the prophecy. Matter of fact, the prophecy was so detailed, they said they would fight over his clothes when he was on the cross. And they did. They fought over his clothes. They stripped him of his clothes and fought over his bloody clothes. That's how detailed the prophecy of Scripture is. Then the Scripture also says that he would be raised from the dead. To bring resurrection power and hope to us. All prophetic. And he fulfills every single piece of it. Here's a, here's a part that a lot of people don't, don't know. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. This was after his resurrection. See, Jesus didn't come out of the tomb, be resurrected, and just go straight to heaven. He walked the earth 40 days with people. Imagine that. Imagine watching right in front of you the resurrection power of God in Jesus Christ for 40 days after you witnessed the bloody cross, after you witnessed the cat of nine tails ripping the skin out of his back, after you saw the crown on his head, after you saw the sword in his side, after you saw him going up that, that, that bloody road of, of, to Golgotha as he fell to his knees, and the cross, well, the way the cross was so heavy that someone else had to help him pick it up and carry it, and you witnessed all of this tragic Many of us in our lives, if we think about it, if we witnessed something like that, would probably create PTSD. Let's get real. But here we have all these people that are witnessing this. Now imagine you're one witnessing this, 
And then all of a sudden, he comes up out of the grave and you walk with him for 40 days. You walk with resurrection power. The man who calls himself the resurrection power. The man who says, I am the life. The man who says, I'm the purpose that I can give to you. I am who I say that I am, and I can do anything in your life. Imagine walking 40 days with this man. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at that and I think about that, this is what I think. I think of Rocky Balboa. <laughs> I know, crazy, right? I love, I love Rocky shows. I, just, I don't know. Maybe it's because I used to love to fight. I don't know what it is. But Rocky Balboa, you know, I don't know how many times in those shows in Rocky Balboa, what ends up happening right at the end? You think he's down. I mean, he's down. He's bloody. He can't even see because his eyes are all swollen. He's got sweat pouring off of him, and you can't tell if it's sweat or blood just pouring off of him. I mean, he looks a mess. I mean, girls, I don't know if we want to date that or not, but, but he was a mess. And he's down. And he's on the ground. And we think he's out. We think that, oh, my goodness, nobody could take another punch after all that beating. And all of a sudden, we see Rocky getting up off that ground. He's grabbing a hold of something. He's getting up. He come, the guy comes up, and he tries to punch him again. Rocky misses it, and Rocky has that one last blow. And the enemy, his opponent is what? On the ground. Right? See, he was down, but he wasn't out. He was down, but he wasn't out. See, Jesus was down for three days, and it was silent. He was down for three days, and people doubted. There was people wondering if he would rise from the dead like the prophecy said. There was people that were going and just feeling like his hopelessness starting to arise inside of them because they didn't know what, if all the hope that they had in Jesus was gone all of a sudden. They did not know. They didn't have the scriptures to tell us the end of the, to, to tell them the end of the story. We do. We know the end of the story. They didn't have that. All they could go on is what was passed down to them, and what was passed down to them, they had to physically witness it with their eyes. So they didn't know. The last time they saw Jesus, he was in the grave. The last time they saw Jesus, he was beaten to death. The last time they saw Jesus, he was in a horrible condition, and he was wrapped in linen clothes that was all around him as it was laying him in the borrowed tomb of a grave of a rich man who was crucified next to two thieves, or a thief and a murderer. A man who calls himself the resurrection and the power. I can just imagine, I mean, he, he tells everybody, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. I'm the one that you can look to for hope. And he walks three and a half years with this message of the gospel. And what does he do? He dies. What? What? He's murdered on a cross. He's thrown in a tomb. And I'm sure that it, the atmosphere of the day was kind of like it is right here, right now. Kind of quiet. Kind of stunned. Kind of, where's he going with this message? Because at that moment, it seemed like the message has been contradicted because you have a man who's talking about, hey, you know what? The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come to give life and life abundantly. And all of a sudden, his life is taken from him. Don't make sense. The contradiction. And for three days, these people are just wondering and wondering. And all of a sudden, he gets up out of that grave. The earth shakes. The stones roll away. And he begins to appear to people. In 1 Corinthians right there, it says that after he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, at one time. In other words, there was a gathering. There was a group of people that was like, what just happened? 
He said he was the resurrection and the life. He said that he would bring freedom. He said he'd bring hope. He said that he is the one who gives life to the death, to the to the things that are dying. He gives life to it, life to it, so that it can live again and restore things. And yet he's sitting in that grave. And now I'm hearing the rumblings of something I've never heard before. And all of a sudden, Jesus is coming out of the grave. I'm curious. I got to go see the message for myself. I got to see this for myself. Because I'm tired of listening to grandma and grandpa's stories. I'm tired of listening to my parents' stories. I'm tired of listening to the preacher's stories and all these other stories. I want Christ for myself, and I want to see, is this real? Is this genuine? See, he appeared to a crowd of 500. There were people gathering. There was people talking. And I want to tell you this morning that when God does something in your life that is completely different than the way you've been living and the way you've been thinking, there's going to be people talking. There's going to be people gathering. They're going to be wandering around and saying, I've got to see this for myself. When I got saved, I was told it was a fad. Why? Because I was into drugs and alcohol and all the crazy things of life. And all of a sudden, my parents and other people were telling me, you know what? That's just a fad that he's going through. This will pass. Well, I'm telling you what. That was October 1989. It is no fad. And there was people that put eyes on my life, and they said, well, I've got to see this for myself. i got to see this for myself. See, when God does a radical change in your life, people will talk. When God does a radical change in your life, people will want to see it for themselves because they know who you used to be. They know how you used to think. They know how you used to be. But now you're saying you're different. Now you're saying that Christ has come into your life and all of a sudden he's turned darkness into light and your, and your hate into love and your unforgiveness into forgiveness and your bitterness into joy. Who, what, what? Oh, I got to see this for myself. And 500 people gathered. There was a rumbling that was happening as this crowd was gathering of brothers and sisters and most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. I'm talking about they have passed on. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles, and the last of all, an unnamely born, he appeared to me. He's talking about himself, Paul. But notice, I want you to notice something here. He doesn't even go to his disciples first. He goes to the lost. He doesn't go to the church first. He doesn't go to those that should know the message first. He goes to the lost. See, we think resurrection is about us, right, as believers. No. Resurrection is about the lost. Resurrection is about going into a dark world that is hope, hopeless, broken, beaten down, and saying, I know the resurrection and the power. I know someone that can change you from the inside out. I know someone that can radically take what you say is impossible and turn it around and create a, a, a possible situation. I know the one that can break through the clouds of heaven, ride back on a horse, and create a new heavens and earth when he comes back. I know the one that can speak to the children in your family and say, you know what, there's nothing that can hold me, hold the Holy Spirit back from moving in their lives and bringing them to the Father. We know that there is a God who can. And you're the testimony of that. You're the testimony of the resurrection. You're the testimony of the life to a world that is dark and is broken. What is the resurrection for? The resurrection is a testimony to the world. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about winning those that don't know. This morning... We know that Jesus is the resurrection in life. There's no question about it. Matter of fact, the resurrection is so important that in Romans 10, see, people have this, this churchy idea of ask Jesus in your heart, and there's nothing in Scripture that says ask Jesus in your heart. And if you've been lied to about that, I'm sorry. What Scripture does say is this. It says this, Romans 10, 8, 9. But what do you say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as 
Lord and believe in your heart that God did what? Raised him from the dead. What does that mean? That means you have to have a belief in the resurrection to be saved. You can't just confess him as Lord. You've got to confess him as Lord and then also believe that he was raised from the dead. So when we confess him as Lord of our life and then we believe that he was raised from the dead, what's the Bible say? Then we will be saved. Not a sinner prayer. Not an ask Jesus in my heart. None of that religious jargon. This is straight, straight Bible right here. It's a one-two. What did you do with the one-two? Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I am sick and tired of trying to be Lord of my life. I have made a disaster. I have made wrong decisions. I have destroyed relationships. I have destroyed jobs. I have destroyed things in my life that I know you meant good by them. But somehow or another, I got in the middle of that, and I made a mess, and I'm done. And so, Jesus, I need you to be Lord. I'm done with me. I get out of the way. And then the second thing I got to do is I got to believe in my heart that he rose from the dead. Why do I have to believe in my heart that he was rose from the dead? Because it's the power of resurrection that gives you newness of life. Without that power, you will not live a holy life. You will not live a righteous life. You will not live a life that is anointed by God to do what he wants you to do. Because it's not you and me. I don't care how well you can sing. I don't care how well you can preach. I don't care how well you can design or create things. I don't care how much you know. If you do it in yourself, it's pride. But when we do it in God, mm, <laughs> Mm, man, man, oh, I'm about ready to run. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Um, I, all these things going through my head of what God's done in my life, and I'm just like, Ooh. um, sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> Woo, man. Um, mm. Mm -mm. um <laughs> man. You know, the greatest, the greatest miracle you witness in your life, the greatest miracle you witness in your life is not healing. The greatest miracle that you witness in your life will not be someone getting delivered. The greatest miracle that you will witness in your life is not somebody getting water baptized or spirit filled or anything like that. The greatest miracle that you will witness in your life is someone giving their life to Christ and accepting the resurrection power in their life to go from darkness to to light and I'm telling you what this morning if you are here and you don't know Jesus and you say well I'm living in too much darkness I've got a hard background and I've got too much going on you don't know where I come from I'm telling you this morning he can and he will change your life he can and he will we have too many people here this morning that can testify to that. You're saying, well, I come from a, a, a really bad background. I'm going to tell you what, I know people right now this morning in here. You think you come from a bad background? We need to sit and talk. I'll set you up with some people. Well, I've not done anything really bad. Yeah, you did. You just admitted your pride by saying that statement. That's sin. We need the resurrection power. We need Jesus. And what greater day to turn our lives over to him? I told you the notes were any good. What greater day to turn our lives over to him and say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord. Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm screwing it up. Every time I think I got it together, every time I think it's working, every time I think that it's right, I find out it's wrong. And it's simply because I've not made you Lord. See, we, we, we talk about, you know, in, in churchy circles, and if anybody gets offended by that, I'm sorry. We'll teach you, we'll give you a teaching on religion and relationship later. But in churchy circles, we, we say, well, we've got to make Jesus Savior. The Scripture never said make him Savior. It said make him Lord. He doesn't become your Savior until you make him Lord. 
He doesn't become your healer until you make him Lord. He doesn't become your redeemer until you make him Lord. He doesn't become your provider until you make him Lord. He doesn't call you friend until you make him Lord. Easter Sunday, what is the Easter Sunday about? It's a reminder to us to look back and realize that we need the resurrection power of Christ in our life, that we cannot do this on our own. We have got to have him. We have got to have him on the inside, working on the outside. And as that old song goes, and some of you may or may not know it, oh, what a great change he's brought into my life. And this morning, many of us have experienced that change. Some of us have not. And this morning, my prayer is that you will. Don't hide behind the excuse. Don't hide behind, well, you know, I, I use that, well, I say that a lot. But you know what that really is sometimes? That's a little excuse to go hide behind and say, well, And this morning, if you need Jesus, you're saying, I'm tired of doing this on my own. I've tried it my way. It just, it got me in trouble. It's messed me up. It's destroyed relationships. You're saying, am I going to have to change friends? You might. I lost all my friends when I got saved, every single one of them. And you know what? I thank God for it. Because all they were doing was pulling me down. But here's the glorious thing. He gave me a new family. He gave me new friends. Some of you, you know, I, I tell the story. It's kind of funny in a way. But, you know, the reason why I went to church was for a girl. You know, people go to church for all kinds of reasons, right? I was chasing a girl. Here's the thing about it. I was chasing a girl. God knew my weakness better than the enemy, and he took my weakness and turned it around for his glory. Isn't that amazing? We come to church for all kinds of reasons. But if we don't come to make him Lord, we've missed it. So I'm going to ask you to do something this morning that's real simple. And some of us have already done this. Some of us have not. And you might say, well, I made him Lord of my life a long time ago. Are you living for him now? Because if you're not living for him now, you've not made him Lord. All you did was say a fancy, fancy prayer. That's all you did. And a fancy prayer is not going to get you to heaven. He has to be Lord. Has to be Lord of your life. But if you're here this morning, I want to ask you to do something real bold and real, real private. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not into whole, the whole embarrassment thing. You know, there's times that we call people up front. There's times we people come up front and we pray. I'm not going to do that. But this is what I am going to do. If you're here this morning and you're saying, I'm done with self. I'm done with self. And I want to live for him. I want to make him Lord of my life. I don't want to say just a fancy prayer. I want to make him Lord. You're saying, man, if I do that, then I've got a, a long list of do's and don'ts. No, that's religion. I do what I do for Christ because I love him, not because I have to. Everybody's on a different journey. We all grow in different ways. That's unique and that's good. If you think coming to Christ is coming to a list of do's and don'ts, you've missed it. Because this morning what he's saying is come to me. All. All. Why? Because when you come to him, he'll embrace you right where you're at. He'll take everything that you are and 
turn it around for his glory. So if you're here this morning, you're saying, I have got to make him Lord. I want to make him Lord of my life. You're tired of living for self. What better day? He was bold enough to go to the cross and publicly die, stripped of his clothes before the whole world for you. Are you bold enough this morning to stand at your feet and say, I need Jesus as Lord of my life this morning? And if that's you this morning, you're saying, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Just stand to your feet right where you're at. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you or anything. Anybody in here, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. He didn't beg. And he wasn't embarrassed. This is, this is the thing about Jesus, is that when he publicly gave his life the way that he did, he wasn't embarrassed to die on a cross for you. He made it public. Public. So I'm going I'm to ask this one more time, and then we're going to move on. But if you're here this morning, I dare you to stand up and say, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. Anybody? Don't be embarrassed. Okay. I know there's some in here that need to do that. At least three or four that I know of. Right off, right off the top of my head, I just... You need to. Don't miss this opportunity. You might say, well, I've got the rest of my life. Tell that to the 16-year-old boy that got saved in our youth group. He got hit by a car on the way home after getting saved that night. I'm not talking about our youth group here. But I'm talking about the one I used to be in. You don't know your time. You don't have the rest of your life. But you have right now. Right now. Anybody want to make Jesus Lord of their life? Amen. Amen. She's got guts. She's, she's bold. Check her out. Amen. Who else? Stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Jesus, Lord of your life. I'm not saying make him Savior. I'm saying make him Lord. There's a difference. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Misty? This is, this is how I do this. You're saying, well, Pastor, I want you to lead me. No, nope. we are a body of community here in one family. So this is how we're going to do this. Misty, if you want to turn around, she's going to lead you to Christ. Amen. Um, Ryan, can you go and pray with the young man here and lead him to Christ? Um, Chris, can you, can you come pray with him? Skip, you, you, you and Chris come pray with him. Lead him to Christ. Amen. We got some lives that are going to be transformed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your love and your grace. I thank you this morning for you are King of kings and Lord of lords. I thank you this morning, Father, that they are not just making you Savior. They're making you Lord this morning. Father, they're crying out to you and they're saying, this morning, I am done with me. They're saying this morning, I'm done with self, and I am saying, God, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. And so, Father, I pray right now for each one of these individuals. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, that transforming power that renews us, that transforming power that changes our hearts and lives from darkness to light. God, I pray right now, move in the name of Jesus. Set them free, God. 
Set them free from addiction. Set them free from depression and anxiety. Set them free from any physical issue that's that's going on. Set them free, God, from any mental issue that's going on. Set them free from their past. Because your word says in Corinthians that all that old stuff is gone. But you have come to bring newness. So, Father, I thank you right now for the transformation and the newness that's taking place right here. And so, Father, we're going to go into this song, Father, as they're praying with these and they're leading them to Christ. Father, I'm praying right now as we go into this song, God, to be like the greatest song of rejoicing ever. <laughs> because, Lord, we're giving you glory because we know that right now the angels of heaven are at attention and they're standing to their feet in celebration of what is taking place under this roof this morning. And, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to dry up. My God will never fail.
this story ends. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see.